there is a global handover of power going on from west to east. Before an empire falls, its money falls. The petrodollar started to crack. The US is not the big guy anymore. That is transitioning over to being China. Welcome to the Staying Free Podcast. In this episode, I have my first returning guest, who is Dan Tubb, also known as King Bingo on Twitter. Now, you may or may not have heard my last episode with Dan, which was episode 19 of the Staying Free Podcast. And in that episode, we were really trying to tease out the link between the kind of authoritarianism sweep in the world um, under the guise of COVID-19 and the situation with kind of global finance and global debt. And in that last episode, I felt like we didn't really get to the crux of the issue. Um, We talked about a lot of really interesting stuff and I definitely recommend that people check that episode out before listening to this one. But by the end of it, um, I did feel there was still a lot of ground that we hadn't covered. So with this episode, we were hoping to kind of continue that deep dive and try to really explain how those two things are linked. But we actually ended up going on a complete other tangent, talking about global geopolitics and the rise of China and the decline of the American empire. And this was no fault of Dan. I kind of failed to steer the conversation into the original intended direction, but I think you'll agree from listening to the episode, Dan has so much insight to offer. It's actually just a really interesting conversation in and of itself. And actually the fact that we didn't end up revisiting the original theme means that Dan has promised me an episode three. So at least this means that Dan will be back for at least another episode. Hopefully you've noticed that this intro is sounding a lot better quality than normal. And that's because I've just got a brand new microphone. So my equipment has been upgraded, which I'm super happy about. Uh, Unfortunately though, my conversation with Dan is with my last microphone. So it's going to take a bit of a dive from this intro, but the good news is that in all future episodes, I'm going to be using this mic. Thank you to everyone for listening as always. If you're enjoying the episodes, please give the podcast a rating on whatever podcast platform you're using. And if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media and share it with your friends, you know, share it on WhatsApp, share it on some other platform. It would be great to be able to reach a wider audience of people who aren't necessarily on Twitter. So if you know someone who is unplugged and ready for these kind of conversations, then please give it a share with those people too. All right, onto the episode. I guess my perception of our last conversation was just that we were we were trying to tackle a lot of territory and it was all really relevant. Actually, that last episode was uh, the most popular one so far. Like got oh, really? a lot okay. a lot of listeners. So, yeah, obviously people people want to hear it. Um so I guess um since you've just listened, if you can just kind of like give us a, a bit of a tail end of that conversation and then we'll we'll dive back into it and cover some new territory. So the question you asked me I, th- I think you asked me three times. That's why I'm particularly conscious of it. What you asked me about three times is how exactly does the um the collapse of the money supply link with the covid authoritarianism yeah yeah i was just thinking i was just making a couple of notes was maybe it's worth stepping back and saying you know what what, what's really going on here and talking about you know essentially what's driving a lot of this is there is a, a a shift in global power from west to um east and and then you know if we're covering that we could start talking about you know ukraine and russia and China yes. and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just start there, uh, and then we'll just riff on it. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me back. Um, I, I, I did wonder if you would because I was I was a, a bit out of it last time. Actually, as it turned out, uh, the, the night after that we did the the talk the first time, I ended up getting the coof, which was a bit unpleasant. The, you got you got the what? I, I got the coof. I got. I, I don't know how much you can say without the bots filtering this out. If, you, if you're putting it on YouTube or Spotify or something, but no, I, I got COVID the uh, the very night of our first podcast. Did you? How ironic. Yeah. So I was sort of having having the sweats and um, you know couldn't couldn't move for about one night, um, and then after that it was sort of fine. Uh, a bit of fatigue for a week or so, um, and it was you know essentially it was it was uh, worse than a cold, but but a hell of a lot better than a flu. I've had flu on a few occasions and it feels like you're going to die. Um, but when I was listening back to our, our, our podcast that we did last time early, I, I could hear my brain was operating at, you know, 50% clock speed. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I did wonder if you're going to have me back, but no, thank, thanks so much for having me back. Um, I, I did wrap it on last time about a whole bunch of points. Where did you want to pick up um, this time on on where we, where we take this chat? Actually, you know what? 
we should do. Let's talk about recent events okay. that have occurred since our last conversation. And then we can always kind of like dip into some of the themes that we were touching on last time. Because I think sure. the 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 kind of big issue that's happened since this conversation is everything that's going on with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess let's start with the conflict itself, and then we can talk about some of their kind of economic um, right repercussions of that. So I think the last time uh, we were just saying, I, I don't know whether um, it was your opinion that Russia would invade Ukraine or that we would respond to it or that there would be an all-out war or that Russia would be sanctioned. But essentially, we're in a situation where they have now been booted from the SWIFT system or have they not? I'm not sure about that. No, I, I don't think they have. So the, the situation is that obviously the US tried to sanction them heavily. And actually, I've, I, I read a really interesting um, article today, which was um, written um, last year in, in 2021. And, and what that is talking about is, is the US strategy to goad um, China into having a small war in Taiwan. And, and what this article does, um, I'll, I'll send you the link of it so you can put it in the show notes. Um, it, it talks about how the, with a limited war, they can arrange the, the global community to heavily sanction them. They can use PR wins to sort of push them back. And they can use this to sort of um, to, to weaken, weaken China. Now, the reason I found this article so interesting is because if you read the playbook of what they're doing, it is very, very similar to exactly what we've seen in the Ukraine. So there were these sort of series of, of constant provocations um, against the sort of the Russian-speaking people in the east of Ukraine until it pushed um, Russia to to um, respond in the way that they did. And then the media has been mobilised and this sort of sanction regime has been put against it. But what's what's really interesting is, is how these sanctions are, effectively haven't worked. So... Um, what was it? The uh, the ruble, I think, you know, collapsed down from sort of eighty rubles um, to the dollar, uh, down to something like one hundred and fifty, and now it, now it's back at eighty. And what I think the US is is learning to their cost is that you can't really sanction um, the world's uh, biggest uh, supplier of commodities, and Russia is an enormous supply of commodities. I mean, it's something like um, half of the world's um, commodities come from Russia. Um, they're the biggest exporter of wheat. They export six and a half million barrels of oil a day, which is you know second only to to Saudi Arabia, um, and, and lots of weird things. So, for example, there's a sort of sapphire silicon substrate that that, that is used on on building up microchips. Ninety percent of that comes from Russia. You know who knew? Um, but what the US is is finding is you is you cannot. Um, simply exclude these people. You know, the, the guy is providing 25% of the of the energy to um, the EU um, without it sort of blowing up on you. So where where I sort of really want to stand back and and look at what's happening at the moment, what's driving a lot of this, including what's driving the paranoia that was expressed by governments over the whole pandemic period, is that there was a global handover of power going on. And, and these happen fairly regularly. So, you know, the, the, the Dutch were the preeminent power and that gave way to the British Empire. The British Empire gave way um, to the um, global American Empire. And that was a very soft transition because culturally the two were so similar um, that a lot of people would be sort of inclined to, to treat the two as sort of one continuous whole. But now what we're seeing is a transition from um, a um, an American global empire, which is you know the America and, and Europe and, and its allies around the world, going over to a to an Asian one. And I I think a lot of you know what we've seen in the recent events is an attempt to an attempt by the US to use its power while it still has it. Yeah, there is this term that they that people in Washington like to use all of the time, um, which is the rules based global order. If you ever listen to American politicians or, or policymakers talk, they, they talk about this all the time. Yeah. And they got the big problem that there were two big holdouts from the rules-based global order, and that's Russia and China. You know, those guys prefer to play by their own rules. Um, you know, they, they, they do cooperate with the World Economic Forum and that lot, but they use it for their own purposes. They're not in that big clubby um, globalist managerial sort of set. They want to sort of plough their own fire. They, you, you, most uh, Western politicians are, are frankly interchangeable. You know, you 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 can have a 
um, you know, the guy who used to be the um, the chair of the Bank of England is, is could well be Canada's next prime minister. You, know, you that sort of crossover effect you see it in, in Europe all the time. You a a ex Belgium you know, prime minister can go on to, to head the European Union, something like that. So this this handover of um, power is is essentially inevitable because the East is rising. They've got the population, their, their manufacturing capability is increasing. And I think what the, the US hoped to do um, was it hoped to, to trigger you know, two conflicts. It wanted to trigger one around the Ukraine, and it probably wanted to trigger one around Taiwan. And it wanted to sell the narrative that this was um, aggression coming from, from Russia and China. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm absolutely not saying that, that Russia and China are the good guys in all of this. Um, but when you when you opt out of the mainstream media narrative and you start looking at these things perhaps a little bit more objectively, you you open up the sources that you are approaching these from. Um, you do see that there is a lot of you know provocation and pushing coming from the US here. And I think what they have discovered to their cost is that it that it hasn't worked. Take Germany, for example. Those guys, uh, they they had a they have a rather bizarre energy policy. So they obviously got rid of their coal power plants. Then they decided that they were going to go all in on Russian gas. On that basis, they then shut down their nuclear power plants. The last of those went offline recently. Then this thing popped up, and they've ended up closing down the, the gas pipeline as well. They have no other option at this point. You know, I believe their strategic reserves will last them until late summer. Well, that's great. You know, it's it's warm in summer. What are you going to do when when winter comes around? Um, and this is the thing that I'm seeing increasingly with the West all of the time, is that they have a, a world view that they imagine of how the world should be. That they've got these sort of ideal idealistic notions, and increasingly they are butting up against reality and geopolitics. Now, it's perfectly possible. Um, in your own country for a very long time to to run a fiction. So, you know, you, you, can, you can see that, you know, the latest thing in the West is is obviously, you know, women's rights versus trans rights. But, you know, a couple of months ago, it was something else. So there's always a new thing, a new, a new conflict. Um, but what you can't do is you can't have um, an energy policy which is based on a fiction because eventually, you know, home, homes are going to go cold and, and industry is going to stop. And, and and that's sort of essentially the big problem. Alongside that, you've got the the money the money issue as well. This is probably the clearest example of where they are trying to you know run two um, contravening narratives. You know, one is that they want to sort of get um, inflation under control. At the same time, they want to get debt under control. And those two goals are sort of mutually exclusive, and and that's obviously what we we talked about a lot in the last one. But you know, give you some numbers around that. Let's say the US wants to get its you know debt to GDP ratio down from 125 percent where it is now to something more manageable, like 85 percent, and that's where it was prior to 2008, the the Great Financial Crisis. Well, if it wants to make that transition, it's going to have to run inflation incredibly hot. And by that I mean a CPI um, of somewhere you know between fifteen and twenty percent for about five years to get that that debt level down. Um, so you're going to have you know a, a monetary system which is running inflation as hot as it can, um, while at some, the same time having the you know the the, the, the stated goal of, of getting inflation down. And, you know these these things are increasingly butting up against um, reality. Okay, just let me let me stop stop you a second there because um, this is something we didn't go into in the previous conversation, and I think this is probably a opportune moment to talk about it. Which is, if inflation is running at fifteen to twenty percent, the natural inclination for people is going to be, okay, well, I need to go and buy as much tin food, dried food, anything, any kind of non perishables as possible now. I need to, you know, I need to buy my fuel now, etc. Because if it's going to cost you literally 20% more a year later, and this is probably going to get even worse than that, then it makes sense that you buy all of these things now and you spend your depreciating money to buy these assets. So to go back to you know trying to 
really understand why things like CBDCs serve this kind of um, monetary paradigm or, or serve the interests of these people who are trying to, to keep um, a lid on this thing. Would you agree that that would be one of the reasons why you need to get people on a CBDC because it's going to stop people going out and basically just buying all of these things. We've already seen these supply um, chain shocks. And if you can imagine everybody going out and buying as much fuel and putting it into jerry cans and buying buying food, et cetera, you know, buying bottled water, whatever it might be, because they know that it's going to be more expensive. CBDCs would allow governments to essentially say, sorry, you can only buy this much tin food now. You can only buy, you know, this much pasta. Uh, you can only buy this much fuel, this much water. So it allows them to kind of keep controls on this thing and allow them to, uh, it allows inflation to run hot without risking a collapse, a complete societal collapse. Yeah, I, I think that is a bit of a less, less of a consideration. Um, so the things that you talked about, about the sort of the buying and hoarding, um, you know, my wife is from Turkey. Uh, and when she was growing up, there was that sort of very high sort of Turkish inflation that you got in the in, in the sort of 80s and 90s. And, and so her instinct is, you know, her and her mother, they they just bulk buy everything. You know, they 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 insist on having sort of a spare room full of full of stuff. It's it's not particularly necessary these days, but you know, they they grew up in that culture where you did exactly what you described is as soon as you got your money, you went out and, and bought the things that you needed because you know they were going to go up next week. I, I think that's less of a consideration at a governmental level. I think that's more just something that happens to people who are living in this sort of in, in inflationary era. Now, actually, what what the drive for things like digital IDs and central bank digital currencies is it just gives them significantly greater control. It gives them greater tools to manage us. What is that control for then? Because I guess this is the, like, let's dive down into that, because um, in my last conversation, I suggested that that control was in order to, for instance, stop people withdrawing money from the bank so that, you know, they can bring in negative interest rates, but people won't go and withdraw all the cash and, and keep it under their bed. And my other theory was that um, these CBDCs would allow them to um, keep a track on what people are buying and put basically um, restrictions on how much or what things people can buy so that inflation can run hot without an existential kind of collapse. So what do they want that control for? I guess that, like, let's get to the crux of that. Well, I mean, they want control because I mean, this is this is what they do. You know, they are they are managerialists. Um, they they believe, I mean, they don't think that they're doing anything wrong. So, from the perspective of you and I, and you know, anyone else who subscribes to the the sovereign individual mindset, you know, we look at these organisations such as the the World Economic Forum and and the various others, who are um, all the time pushing for these mechanisms where they can intervene in our life and tell us what to do. You know, you, you, even, even, the, even a conservative government now, it is, you know, you, you have to drive an, a, an EV, uh, an electric uh, vehicle uh, by 2030, and you can't have, you know, this type of boiler from, from 2030. You know, the, it, from our point of view, that looks um, um, stifling. It looks like they're they're eroding our liberties and they're sort of you know they're leading us up into this sort of soft authoritarianism. From their point of view, they don't believe that they're doing anything wrong. They simply believe that they are doing the job that they are expected to do, um, which is it's which is to manage manage a problem. And and what's the interesting thing that's happened to Western society over the last sort of fifty years is um, you know we have moved from a culture where uh, individuals are, you know, the, uh, essentially the end point, you know, they, they are the ultimate authority and, and the state is is there to support them and to enforce their liberties to us being a problem which politicians and, and supranational organisations have to manage. Is that just a cultural phenomenon, though? Or because, again, like my my immediate kind of instinct is to try to look for a financial explanation for that because I, I normally i think that you know culture is kind of downstream of some of these other factors in particular the way that kind of money's managed etc so why why has government um morphed into this entity which is trying to kind of control everything is that just because we've become soft or you know is there something more sinister at play so 
So I, th- I think there, there are there are two factors. Um, one of them is, I think you, you're absolutely right. It is it is the money itself that that has engendered this. Uh, that's what we spent a lot of time talking about in our previous podcast. Of course, it was the the fiat money system. Now, you know, I'm sure most of the people listening to this uh, would, would have listened to that one as well. But to very briefly recap the, the key points made there. In 1971, we switched from a um, a hard money system, uh, which was essentially a, a money backed by gold, which meant that you could not um, deficit finance for, for a particularly long time. You know, governments had to spend within their means, to a a fiat money system, which meant that the governments could could essentially create money ad infinitum for as long as they wanted. It. Well, up until about today. When the, when the debt levels have got out of control and it's threatening to, to, to bring down the whole system. If you have a monetary system which is always expanding and debt is always going up and there is this extra money being created, what you've got to look at is, is where is that money being created? Um, and and w- what essentially is happening is it, is it is creating in that sort of nexus between government and finance and that's why both of those things have become so disproportionate to where they were in 1971. So prior to that period, a working man um, doesn't even need to be a professional. It could be you know, somebody who's simply a skilled, um, a skilled craftsman of, of some sort, you know, semi, semi-skilled professional, um, could easily afford to support a family and a, and a, and a stay-at-home spouse on a single salary and could reasonably expect to have his mortgage paid off you know, e- easily within 10 years, if, if, if not less than that. Mm-hmm. What's happened since then is because of the, because of the growth of the, of the money supply and because that starts in the sort of government, that nexus between government and finance, what it means is that those two things have grown disproportionately. So the share of the economy, which is um, government, has risen significantly. Um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the number would have been for for 1971. But I mean, to give you an example, the, the British Empire was running on a on a on a government where the government was was taking up something like five percent of GDP. I think it's over fifty percent now. It is exactly right. Yeah, it's over fifty percent now, and, and that drive has happened because this this whole funny money system has allowed government to expand significantly. And the other one is, of course, like I said, is finance. So that that guy who uh, previously would have paid off his mortgage in his house within 10 years. Um, you know, a, a young man buying a house today, uh, well, first of all, you know, if, he, if, he, if he's doing it as part of a couple, and you probably have to be in order to, to get on the property ladder today, it's quite it's very, very difficult to, to do it as a single person. You know, both of them need to work. Um, and the amount of um, the, the amount of years they're going to have to work just just to pay off the bank has gone from, you know, you you, you could work out, you know, how much of your life um, you were working basically just to pay off interest on your house. And you know, back in the back in the sort of middle of the century, it would have been about three or four years of your life went to paying off debt. Um, these days, I, you know, I forget the numbers now, but it, it, it's it's closer to sort of it's in the sort of twenty to thirty year range. Where all you're doing is 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 working to pay off the interest that you accumulate over your life, and and that's you know various sources, the student debt, and the, and the big part being the mortgage as well, and and all the while that you're doing that, of course, half of it's going to to government as well. So because of those because of those you know because of those factors, the system has has grown and consumed it, um, and the second thing is is probably because um, people are are comfortable and happy. You know, yeah. Again, people like us, people who ascribe to the the sovereign individual mindset, we like to take um, charge of over, over our own destiny, our own future. Um, but a lot of people, as we saw over over the COVID period, are all too happy to to basically hand away um, any any rights, um, any sense of self responsibility to to an authority figure. I think this is where we're going to see a bit of a. Um, a shift, or, or in my opinion, a big shift, is that, as I was saying before, I think that these kind of, there's these underlying factors which are going to change um, culture. And one of them, a, a big one, is kind of financial imperative. And I think now that you have a system whereby, essentially, if you're staying in fiat money to a significant degree, 
you're going to just continue to lose value. And the only way to escape it is to switch to another system. I think it's going to kind of force, it's going to trigger a kind of financial imperative within people to make that shift. And I think that that's a, that's a huge pull factor, right? Like if you think about what are the biggest factors in life that would affect someone's behavior, one of them is, you know, people want to always be more wealthy. And I think that if it's between people staying ignorant and staying poor or, you know, wising up to how the financial system works and becoming more wealthy, you know, we've always kind of had that before, I guess. And, you know, that you've always had gold bugs and things and people who want to invest in stocks, et cetera. But when it's at the point where literally your day-to-day life, your store of value, the fundamental, you know, place where you put your, your wealth and you store the product of your labor, when it becomes incumbent on you, upon you um, to put it into something else, you know, to store it in some other way. I think that people will will naturally do that. And I think that maybe we need that. Maybe we need this to, to kind of shift society into a new direction. Although you don't want people to, to kind of like lose the, uh, you know, to, to have financial hardship, it's kind of causing a trigger for people to actually lose trust in these institutions and, and move in a di- new direction, which, you know, previously people wouldn't have been so aware of. But I think that 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 difference, these two roads are really diverging between the people who are taking more sovereignty over their wealth and people who are trusting traditional financial institutions, which are ultimately uh, leading them to um, financial ruin. Yeah, I I think that's exactly right. I mean, you are getting increasingly lots of um, younger people, especially who are making that transition over to the crypto environment. That I think is probably fits in with my sort of best case scenario of, of how we get through the, the current debt trap and the, the, the current financial crisis. And that is to say that the current system limps along, albeit through periods of high inflation and other disruption for, for maybe, I don't know, another debt cycle, which is eight to 12 years. And during that time, people have made the transition over to, I suspect, Bitcoin. Although it could be other hard monies, it, it, you know, potentially it could be gold, although I suspect it will be Bitcoin. So that when that moment of maximum pain um, reaches us, there will be so many people on the other side that you can allow the old system to fail without it being too devastating um, for, for too many people. So you can sort of effectively step across, you know, as, as one ship sinks, you can, you can step across to the other one. But a lot of people are going to get hurt in that. A lot of people are, are not going to get this. Um, and they are going to stay in the traditional financial system. Or maybe they've been paying into a, a pension for the last 30 or 40 years, which is in that old financial system. And if you have got a pension in that system, um, you know, a lot of it is going to be in, you know, in the worst of the worst, it's going to be in government bonds. Bonds that are being inflated away. Like I say, I think their goal is going to be to try and maintain something north of of 10% inflation, and that's on the official CPI figure, for at least five years. So the effect that you're going to have on on something like bonds, which is a large part of of older people's pensions, is going to be quite devastating. So, yeah, I mean, it, it does give me some hope that people are going across to this. It's probably the only way that we have of, of finding a peaceful resolution to this. But there will be a lot of people who get who get hurt along the way. Yeah, on that point, actually, I've been wondering about this. Like, I've been trying to kind of figure out based upon the situation we fi- find ourselves in with um, the economy, like the global economy, not just on a, on a national level. And I kind of, you know, try to tease out like where this is going. If they do run inflation that hot, then what are they going to do about, you know, people's pensions are essentially going to be just devalued by that much every year. Now that's then going to cause um, people to not have enough money in their pension fund, which presumably will mean that their next port of call is to sell their house or something, you know, sell their assets. And if you end up having mass um, a mass movement of people selling their properties in order to get cash to buy day-to-day things because their pension is now worthless. I mean, that then triggers a collapse of the um, housing market, which is where most people actually have their wealth. You know, that their their wealth is tied up in this property, which they've been inflating this bubble again and again and again for years, this housing bubble. It seems like they can never allow that to crash. So, you know, when I think, okay, well, where does this end up going? I come back to, okay, well, they're going to have to print money to reinflate the housing bubble. If they don't print money now to keep the the pension bubble going, 
then they're going to have to print the money to then reinflate the housing bubble because otherwise people are completely wrecked and have no assets and then they're going to come to the government anyway and say we need welfare. So all roads for me lead to a kind of existential level collapse. Like am I being am I being a um am I am I being dramatic there or or do you see the same kind of you know fundamental inescapable paradigm? I, I don't think you're being dramatic in the slightest. So I, I spend a lot of my time listening to uh, it, it's like a version of YouTube, except it's it's for finance people, um, and it gets a lot of the, the sort of top thinkers in the finance space, people from the hedge fund world, um, people who've got re, you know really serious financial credentials behind them discussing these things, and they're all essentially saying the same thing. You know, the, the question is often posed if you were. Um, if you were the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, you know, one of the or one of these other big central banks, you know, what would you do differently? And, and invariably, the discussion comes to, well, I, I would quit. I, I, you can't win. These guys cannot win anymore. Yeah, because they've let the debt get so high for for decades that you basically have to default. Yeah. Now there are various ways that you can default. You can um, restructure the debt to say that you know bondholders get whatever it is, you know, 40 cents on the dollar for, for, for what, whatever they've had. You know, the US and UK, they're, they're not going to do that. That would be, uh, that, you know, that would make them look like a, a banana republic, but they can't afford to pay it either. So they are going to have to, uh, you know, default on the other way. And the other way you do it is that you you print so much money that the value of each particular dollar goes down and, and therefore the value of your your debt goes down and as a cute and sorry benefit to that you know that that new money that's being created gets flushed through government and finance so the people who are you know pushing this line uh, get to benefit from that as well but what that's going to do is it's, it's going to push up high inflation so at the moment what you've got is you've got the you know the federal reserve and other big central banks who essentially you know, it's like they're trying to ride two horses with one ass it, it can't be done. So they're, they're, they're trying to maintain this level of credibility, which is, you know, you can trust us um, to, to shepherd the financial system by keeping inflation down, while at the same time um, trying to shrink the debt pile. You know, you can do one, but not the other. Um, and they will choose the inflation route because the alternative is they have to restructure the, the debt in such a humiliating way uh, that it, it sends a very clear message to the world that the uh, the reign of the the American empire has ended when you get to that point. And this sort of brings me back to my sort of opening point, which is when you really zoom out of all of this, what is essentially happening is there is a global power handover from um, the Western world to the Eastern world. And, and that is uh, that is preceded by the money of the declining power going through a period of of, of decline, and, and you have seen this every time that there is a a um, a global handover of power. You know, before an empire falls, its money falls, and and usually, actually, at the point of maximum. Um, transition. So, so exactly at the point where you know the the old power is declining and the new power takes over, there, there's usually a war. That didn't happen when there was a transition from um, the the British Empire to the American Global Empire, because those two were so culturally aligned that it sort of felt to sort of everybody involved that it was a, a sort of a, a transition to the same. But historically, when you go back and you look at the sort of big transition, there, there's, there's been a war. And I think that is closer to, to what's happening now. So that, that's why I think um, that the US has decided that while it's still got its power, what it wants to do is it wants to see regime change in places like Russia and China. It wants to get them into that uh, rules-based global order, because then... You know, even if they do become the dominant power, if they are working on a on a Western mindset, a Western paradigm, that's an easier pill to swallow. If the people who are people who are going to be the new boss think like you, and they are assigned, they are they're signed up to the the same sort of you know globalist regimes and and bodies and orders that you know that you can influence as well. So, do you think that the policymakers in the USA? they recognize that the days of the US empire are numbered and that right now they are, because it almost seems like they're kind of playing um, two games at the same time in a sense, because you've got the 
the saber rattling with Russia, which is not really even saber rattling anymore. You actually have a a, a hot war and essentially a proxy war through uh, Ukraine between um, you know the United States and and the NATO allies versus Russia. But but then at the same time you have a seeming when it comes to these big global organizations like you know the um, the WHO and the World Economic Forum, etc., you've kind of got this buddying up with China and almost like a kind of Chinification of the West. Um, you know, things like um, social credit scores and you know, even just the fact that you're not really allowed to criticize China, the fact that there's still been absolutely no admission um, from Western media that China faked all these people falling down and, you know, collapsing on the street in the pandemic. You've you've kind of got this um, culture this kind of global culture of China can do no wrong. We can never criticize them. But then, but then when it comes to Russia, uh, it's quite the opposite. It's almost like Russia is, you know, inherently evil, and and you know we must fight them in every corner type thing. Do, do you see what I mean? It's almost like there's a different strategy for Russia and for China uh, happening at the same time. And you know, I, I'm I can't quite explain that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, a part of that is because China's so damn good at playing the game. That, that that's essentially what's driving it. So I, mean, I, th- I think they've spotted it. I mean, they are very effective at you know these these sort of political machinations and games. So you know, let, let's rewind this back to you know the Cold War period. Um, the, the the Kissinger, the Henry Kissinger strategy was to prize off um, uh, China. Um, from from Russia because because Russia was the uh, Russia was the, the big threat at the time, and so they did that by pallying up with China, which at the time was you know it's a large country but it was very minor in economic terms. The USSR was was significantly more uh, the, the the powerful entity um, of the two. And while they were going through that process of, of splitting China off, you know, they realised that there were sort of kickbacks to be made from it. There was there was money to be money to be made along the way, um, and and that sort of pallying up with with certain elements in the US establishment sort of continued. And, and what's essentially happened is the people who are um, the the dominant decision makers in the US have not readjusted their thinking. Because they have remained close to the, the sort of the money and the kickbacks from from the Chinese, while not recognizing that they have become the, the main threat and that, that that China is now a minor power. Now that is not to say that there aren't. Or well, Russia, Russia is a minor power now. Well, compared to China, you know, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, so you, the, said, you said that China is a minor power, but did you mean Russia? Right, is the, the minor, chi- so China yeah. was originally the minor power in, in, in when they started this strategy, and it's it's, it's sort of transitioning the other way. Um, now, now, that is not to say that there are individuals um, in the US establishment who who don't think that, who, who don't recognize this. So, I mean, I would point to uh, you know, a book that recently came out. It's called Strategy of Denial. And it was written by a former deputy assistant of uh, the Secretary of Defense. And it talks about a strategy to, um, to, to, to denude Chinese power um, before they overtake the West. But this sort of muddled thinking of, you know, how are we going to take down our geopolitical rivals and how are we going to, you know, provoke them into these sort of, you know, what was supposed to be small wars has been backfiring on them. So it's, it's backfired quite significantly with the, with the Russian thing because, you know, what, what they thought they were, what was going to happen was that, um, you know, they, uh, that Russia would be um, isolated yeah. by the international community and that they would have to comply and they would have re- weakened Russia in the process, that could then potentially lead to regime change in Russia and they could get their, their sort of globalist puppet in place who would then follow the, the rules-based global order that I talked about. What has actually happened is that Russia have just decided that they will um, transition to, rather than a Western strategy, to an Eastern strategy. So I mentioned that, that Russia is exporting about 6.5 million barrels of oil a day. I think that will just go now to the east. So two and a half, so two and a half million barrels of that was already going to China anyway. The other four million barrels will probably then get split off, you know, more to China, who, who will happily take the extra energy. Um, you know, some of it will go to to India and Pakistan and, and Turkey and, and other places in the region. You know, those resources um, that were flowing out of there will again, they will just get redirected to the West. Now that's very dangerous, sorry, to, to the East. Now that's very dangerous for the West 
because for a long time the thinking was that each of these eastern um, powers were 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 deficit in something that was important. So take um, Russia, for example, uh, very high levels of commodities, but an older population and doesn't have a strong manufacturing base. You look at China, um, again, the demographics are, are bad, largely as a result of the one-child policy, so that their, their population is too old. Um, very low commodities, but an excellent manufacturing base. Then you've got the whole kind of uh, the monsoon region going around that, uh, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, um, you know, in India, Pakistan, that, that whole sort of region around there. Um, they have something of a growing manufacturing capacity, um, somewhat limited resources, but, but superb demographics. They've got lots of young people. All the time that you kept those separate and you played them off against each other, that, that was good for, for Western Geopolitical, geopolitical interests. What the US has done in its heavy-handed approach with Russia is basically pushed those guys into a new block. And you're starting to see it happen. So um, you are you are now getting you know Russian and Chinese militaries going on joint exercises. Um, you know, they're coming out and saying, um, you know, that their their senior politicians coming out and saying that they are signing packs of you know enhanced friendship or or, or stuff like that. And if you combine um, that eastern region into a block, you now have resources, manufacturing, uh, and a young demographic. Now, China would essentially be the leader of that, um, where they would essentially move up the, the value chain of the manufacturing. You know, they, they would go to late stage production rather than component manufacture where they are now. They would push out a lot of the grunt work to the the area with a with a strong demographic, so that sort of monsoon region, the, the Southeast Asia and, and the India, and so you'd see a lot more of the low level manufacturing being pushed out to there because they've got the manpower for it, um, and then they and then Russia would come in and, and supply the commodity side of it, and and, and you know the the food and the oil and the and the, and the stuff that went into the ele electronics. Now once once you've got that pack, that's very strong. Yeah, and. You know, the, the thing is, like, none of this kind of had to be. I, I know that people, a lot of people, they think that China's ascent, you know, China's kind of great success of becoming this kind of economic superpower um, was some kind of natural thing. But without the West kind of permitting that through organizations like the World Trade Organization and things like that, would you agree that China wouldn't be where they are? Like China would would not have achieved this kind of supremacy if it hadn't have been for the fact that we had kind of allowed China to participate in the capitalist um, geopolitical order, but then also whilst maintaining their kind of communist um, regime internally, where they kind of were able to you know, ha have their own policies in, in place to, to essentially get an advantage where everyone else was playing, like you said, that there was this kind of um, rules-based order for the rest of the world, but China just basically did what they want and, you know, they, they didn't care about things like patents and they didn't care about, uh, you know, things like maintaining honest um, convertibility for currency, et cetera. They kind of centrally planned everything deliberately for the outcome of, I guess, kind of siphoning um, economic power from the West through the way they ran their economy. Do you see what I'm saying here? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in terms of if you are looking at it from a, um, a Western homogeny uh, type, type approach, you know, yes, that was a, a blunder by by transitioning him into this, um, the World Trade Organization, because effectively, mm. you know, China cheated at it. You know, they, they used it to their advantage um, and they didn't respect any of the sort of intellectual property rights that came along with it. However, you know, I've got to say that it is probably a net good for everyone if you take um, billions of people, you know, the, whatever it is, the, the two billion odd people that you've got in China, the you know one and a half billion people you've got in India, and you elevate them um, to a point where they can contribute meaningfully to um, innovation, um, right. the world would be a much richer place with an additional several billion minds. Um, working to provide, you know, solutions and, and contributing effectively to the economy. But isn't it a risk, though, that we've we've kind of given this communist regime essentially a a pass? We've kind of 
most of the world now thinks or, or many people might think oh well you know co communism is fine communism can ele elevate people from poverty because look at what china's done rather than looking at it and saying well china did well because they were invited into the capitalist world order um but actually if they were left to their own uh, devices yes of course nobody wants you know groups of people and populations etc to remain in poverty but the the downside of what what we've done by yes we've we've brought a lot of people out of poverty by inviting them into the kind of capitalist global order but at the same time we've falsely um given the perception that chinese communism has been the a success story where where actually it actually would not have been were it not for the participation of the west yeah, so I mean, in that respect, but but then that sort of takes us back to what I was talking about earlier about how the West feels that it has a limited time yet left to use its clout to sort of bring the Chinese into the Western way of thinking. So what you've essentially described is is a is a microcosm of what the approach out of um, Washington has been that they, they 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 want to try and make them, you know, think along our ways and, and play by our rules. Yeah, and 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 the. Uh, well, essentially, they, they they failed at it. You know, they 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 try to make them like us, and and, and everything that they have done has, has failed. Um, and what you're going to increasingly see is that the world is going to start to care less um, about the, the sort of the Western norms and, and the Western moralities. So, you know, you saw that um, when it started to become apparent that um, the U.S. sanctions against Russia was not working. A number of things started to happen from that. So uh, a, a big part of the American global empire's power is its, is its petrodollar. And that is to say that if you trade energy anywhere in the world, the deal is that you do it in dollars. It doesn't matter if you are, you know, South America, you know, say you're, you're Venezuela selling oil to, to South Africa, you know, you have to do that, that trade in dollars. And what it means is that um, people are always having to acquire dollars and spend dollars and earn dollars. Um, and then when they've got all these dollar reserves, what do they do with them? They go and buy US denominated debt. Now, that has been a system which is enormously powerful for the US because if people are continuously from all over the world uh, buying US denominated debt, and they don't pay off this money, as we've established. They just they just let the debt piles pile up. That essentially means the U.S. has been has been getting free money from all over the world for several decades now. What does that mean? Buying U.S. U.S. denominated debt. Does that mean that essentially they're buying up things like when the, when the banks lend out money and they have essentially a customer who has to pay that pay back that money that they kind of combine all of these different you know, mortgage agreements, et cetera, in some kind of financial product and then say, hey, you buy this office for a fixed price and then they, and then we, you know, the money that comes in for all of that debt, which is being paid off incrementally, goes to the new debt owner. I, I've never quite understand what that means, um, but that's my best guess. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what you're talking about there is, is private sector debt, you know, something through the financial system, but but normally it's not even that. So, so let's go back to our example we talked about. So the situation where you've got... Um, Venezuela selling its oil to South Africa because the basically the agreement is that everybody has to sell energy denominated in oil. That means that these countries then have to, well, they have to accumulate dollars. So they need to uh, produce stuff of value. They then need to um, sell it to the US in order to get those dollars so that they can then do these energy trades around the world. So everybody ends up with a demand for dollars and they end up with a surplus of dollars. What do you do with all these dollars that you've got floated around? Well, you need to find a dollar-denominated way of storing them. And what people typically do, or what countries typically do, is they then go and buy dollar-denominated debt. So China did this for a long time. It was earning a huge amount of dollars by uh, producing useful, well, I say useful stuff, you know, plastic tat or, or whatever it was that they produced. Selling it to the US, getting all those dollars. And then for a long, long time, they were the biggest purchaser of um, treasury bills. So we got all these dollars, we're going to buy that debt off you. Now, if you're the US, that essentially means what's happening to you is the world is sending you productive resources, 
or finished products or, or wh- whatever it is that you want. The world is sending you these things. And in return, you're giving them pieces of paper, you're giving them debt, debt that you have no intention of paying off. You're simply going to accumulate it year after year. So that has given the US, um, I, th- I think a French finance minister called it an exorbitant privilege. So when you're talking about debt, you just mean like... So, debt. I mean, w- when you get up into these sort of you know billions of levels, you, you, you don't just leave your money floating around in a bank. You need something to put your money in. Um, and, and the preferred method for storing dollars is, is normally um, uh, treasury notes. So so this is this is debt issued by the US government, um, short-term treasury bills, which is to say, you know, you, you can buy for whatever it is. I, I think the way their system works is something like, you know, for $90, $95, you can buy a $100 bond that will mature in, you know, a, a few years' time. And, and that's the way that you save your money if you have a, a high amount of dollars. So that's why I talk about the American global empire because even though it may look like you know the us does not go around the world conquering lots of places like former empires have you know the british empire would go off and it would it would color bits of the bits of the world map pink the us doesn't need to do that because with this petrodollar system it is able to make everybody send it tribute effectively so that petrodollar system has proven to be incredibly powerful for them it has allowed them to spend more than they had a right to because everybody is buying their debt and therefore giving them money. That has enabled them to run a very large military. And with that very large military, they've been able to do things like make sure that people stay on the petrodollar. So if you look at a list of people who have made a break from the petrodollar system, there was a strong overlap between that list and people who have died horribly in the streets. So, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein is one of them. He decided to come come off the uh, the petrodollar. And very quickly after that, you started seeing um, war propaganda put out in the West saying, you know, this man must be dealt with. They, they manufactured the, the reason to go after him. Um, same with Gaddafi. Yeah. You know, he, he was allowed to, to do his thing for decades. But the day he came off the petrodollar system and wanted to sell his oil um, not on the not, not on the dollar standard, you know, very quickly he found himself at war, and he found himself ousted. So the the US has been very strong on making sure that nobody ever comes off it. And the linchpin to this whole system was Saudi Arabia, because the deal with the petrodollar was essentially that the US will provide um, security guarantees to the Saudis. You know, we've got your back. The price for that is you have to make sure that all of your oil is sold in dollars to whoever you sell it to. So the petrodollar is a really, really big thing. It has underpinned US power for decades. It's really important. So why do I mention that in relation to the Russia thing? Because when the US thought that it could sanction Russia the same way that it can sanction a much smaller economy, and it discovered to its shock that the sanctions weren't working. You know, the ruble went, you know, from 80 up to 150, back down to 80 again, because everybody realized actually it's not Russia that's got the problem here because they can sell it to the East rather than the West. It's the West that's got the problem because they need the energy. When it was realized how weak the US actually was, against how strong we we thought it was. I mean, the US is still strong, but it is not as strong as we thought it was. And, and the two big points is going to be the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the absolute rout that that was. And the second thing is going to be the failed sanctions on Russia. The petrodollar started to crack. The Saudis agreed to sell oil to China in, um, in the Yuan, I think, or the Renimbi. Um, you saw, you know, various other countries doing things. So another thing that Saudi Arabia did is they, they they had the largest ever number of executions in their in their public square they'd ever done. I think they executed something like ninety eight people in a single day. Both of those things would not have happened if they still feared the US or they still felt that keeping the US on side was the most important thing for them. Clearly, the calculation, and this is taking place all over the. Um, the East at the moment is that um, the US is not the the big guy anymore. You know that is transitioning over to being China, 
And actually, we don't need to worry about Western sensitivities about beheading people in the town square. And we don't need to honour the petrodollar system anymore. Instead, we can start to do things that are more favourable for this Eastern Bloc. Right. So we are seeing lots of examples of, of how this transition from one great power to another is occurring. That um, transition, has it already occurred? And it's just that we're... It almost seems as if it's so irreversible that it, we might as well consider it to have already taken place, the, the transition of global hegemony to uh, China. Well, yeah. So, I mean, if, if you look at the, the growth rates, the population, um, you know, the increasing share global trade, I mean, it is pretty much inevitable that we are going to transition from a Western-led global order um, to one where the, where the East is the dominant power. That is pretty much inevitable. I, I think a lot of people, you know, e even even the, you know, e even the most neocons of neocons in, in the US have, have acknowledged that this is going to happen. You know, the only question is 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 how much influence can the West have on shaping um, what this what sort of norms the the new order follows? Yeah, and that's why the absolute dream state for them would be to achieve a regime change in both Russia and China before that transition happened because you know russia is you know perhaps not wildly different to, to you know something like canada canada is a big um exporter of you know commodities um you know they, they produce gas and oil as well and, and justin trudeau is is a world economic forum puppet i mean the, the guy has no original thoughts of his own you can imagine how appealing it would be um, for for the you know the, the advocates of the of the rules based global order, if you could get a, a Russian version and a Chinese version of Justin Trudeau installed in in both of those countries, so so they've wanted to do that, they have just been unsuccessful, and I think a lot of what's happening in in Ukraine and you know we we haven't we haven't dived into you know some of the deeper your machinations of what's going on there and how it was provoked and, and so on. But I'm, I'm sure we've all listeners, you know, they, they, they've looked into that for themselves. That was a sort of, a, in my mind, that was essentially a, a push to get the regime changed there. And also it was a trial run to see if Russia could be brought to Hill. Um, could the same thing happen with, with China and, and Taiwan? Mm -hmm. You know, could they be provoked into a small war that you know they could then be sanctioned against, and you you know trickle the rest of it? And, and I think what what the world is discovering very quickly is that the uh, the US is 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 weaker than even the US thought, and so you are getting this 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 speedier realignment. And I think what you're going to see more and more of is you know the uh, you know countries like you know Pakistan and India. Uh, caring a lot less about you know what's important to us um, and working closer so it's going to mean that less resources come our way yeah less energy is going to come our way uh and, and effectively what what that's done is it's made all this this green agenda a, a bit of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy um you know that that was started for you know essentially idealistic reasons but now it's going to become an, uh, an uh, essential, effectively, um, because the, the the big energy producers are not going to want to give us their energy. Now, the UK can get away with it to an extent because the UK can frack. Um, the UK does have some energy sources of its own, but lots, lots of Europe simply does not have that option. So having alienated the big energy providers, they're actually going to have to follow through on a lot of the of the green energy stuff, simply because it, it it's something that they can actually do within within their own boundaries. Uh, okay, and the other thing let, they're going to have just, to, yeah, so, yeah, actually, make your second point, and then I'll interject. Yeah, the other thing they're going to have to give up on is their aversion to nuclear, because you know, with the best will in the world, renewables is not going to get them close. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd agree with that. And yeah, you you mentioned there that this green agenda is going to become a self self fulfilling prophecy. I mean, could it be that the the green agenda was being pushed because, in part, it's almost like a fail safe for all this stuff happening, and it's like the, the green agenda. Again, the green agenda, and this kind of brings me back to this wider point, which is that the green agenda just seems like really convenient given everything that's going on now. It's it's kind of justified in many ways the green agenda in the same way that that COVID justified the 
kind of digital ID and I guess the um, you know central bank digital currencies. It's almost like all of these things are kind of being conveniently justified by geopolitical events. And I wonder whether it's the tail wagging the dog. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder about that. Although I would say I'm I'm not sure they're necessarily smart enough to sort of plan it up in that way because essentially they're they're screwing things up and then you know falling back on their on their preferred set of solutions. You know, if if they wanted to achieve their preferred set of solutions, there, there were certainly smarter ways of of going about it than than absolutely sort of crippling civil society as they go. Like I said, Germany um, is is going to be in the situation where it doesn't have any energy this winter unless it, it pivots on something. Now you think about how big a problem that's going to be for the German leadership. So they've got two sort of essential, almost religious-like shibboleths. One of them is that they are part of a um, globalist sort of progressive agenda. You know, the, these people, they, they they do follow US politics. You know, the, the, the Germans made... Um, you know, they, they certainly didn't hide the fact that they absolutely despise Donald Trump. You know, you've got that video of them chortling at him when he's um, giving that speech, saying that that Germany is is putting itself in the position where it's dependent on on Russian energy. Um, and, and you see this all over Europe. I mean, you know, Obama yeah. got that that Nobel Peace Prize within you know a couple of months of him coming into office. So y- European globalist progressives which basically includes all of them, including you know the, the, uh, most of the right-wing party, certainly it includes the, the Conservative Party in the UK. The adherence to the sort of the, um, the US progressive agenda is a really big part of their psyche. Another really big part of their psyche, especially in Germany's case, because remember it's the Green Party who recently won the election there and have been pushing this, is an aversion to nuclear an aversion to you know traditional forms of energy um but they can't have both so if, if they stick to that aversion to traditional energy including nuclear and they stick to being part of the um the, the globalist you know uh, american regime and all the sort of thinking that goes along with that they're going to have to shut down industry this winter they're going to have to let homes um, they're going to, have to let people freeze in their homes unless they give up on something. And it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, what do they pick? Do they do they do, they do a, a vault face on nuclear? Do they break with the US and, and open up those pipelines again, or do they let people freeze? And you know, I, I don't know which one it's going to be, but you know, whichever way it goes, it's, it's going to be you know extremely unpleasant for people while they go through this transition. So long, long term, the only thing that they've left open for themselves is sort of massive expansion of renewables. Which you know maybe if that was on on a twenty or thirty year plan, yeah, maybe they could get to it. But you know they need to do it by November. Right, right, right. Dan, I'm going to start running this up. We, I still feel like there's so much that we ha- have yet to to cover, and I still feel like this pivotal question, which we've been trying to kind of get to the root of since our first conversation, is unanswered. But this is not a bad thing because I feel like these conversations have been really good. You know, you have so much knowledge on a variety of areas. It's, I think it's better to just kind of let these conversations flow as they do. And if we don't answer the kind of um, core question, then that's fine. Like we'll, we'll attack it next time because I think there's just so much value to be had from all of these kind of surrounding topics anyway. So maybe think of it like peeling an onion. One layer yes. at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it is. So it's been really great. And, you know, you've been so generous with your time and with your knowledge, as always. I'm going to suggest that we do a round three at some point. Be delighted to. Yeah, because it's, um, you know, I know that people uh, appreciated the last episode. I'm sure they'll appreciate this one. So I'll leave it to you to just kind of um, let people know where to find you and kind of round things off. Any last words that you have. Uh, but yeah, you know, th- thanks again. And um, we should definitely do another one of these. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah, it, it's a great conversation. You know, we are we are peeling the onion down to the core here. Um, you know, a lot of bad decisions have been made in the West for a long time, and I think essentially where we're getting to is that the West is going to have to uh, have an attitude readjustment. Is going to have to come to terms with the fact that it is it, it can no longer throw its weight around. It can no longer you know imagine the future that it wants and then force that into action. A, a lot of power is going to be taken out of its hands. Now, I take no particular joy from this. Um, because actually I, I do think the West is is the best. 
mm-hmm. but you know our, our our time as um sort of global leaders is is, is effectively ending where can people find me um at the moment i it's, it's just my little twitter account and i pop up on the occasional podcast from time to time brilliant all right until next time cheers dan thanks very much